Now this talk is on language and style. This word style, there is a very close Indian counterpart or the, which means the same. Anybody? Style. Sanskrit. It comes from Sanskrit, but it is there in Gujarati, it is there in Hindi, in uh, South Indian languages. Style. Shaili. Shaili, exactly. So the Anglo-Saxons have taken this from, from Sanskrit. Style. A lots of um, Sanskrit words have got into, especially in medical uh, literature, like the heart. Heart comes from Hrid, Hrid, Hridik Roshan, no? Hrid. And uh, dermatology comes from Charma, Charma. And dental comes from Dental. So, same way, style comes from Shaili. Right, now, learning to write. Writing is a skill like golf. Some persons are naturally good at it, most are not. But like everybody else, can improve with practice, especially if guided by a coach or proper instruction. So good writing fundamentally stems from good thinking. On the practical level, Transferring good thinking into words on paper is a skill. If you have, I mean, I may differ. If there is a doubt, they can ask me, so I'll, yes. okay. Now, again, learning to become a better writer can be compared to learning to swim. No matter how long you stand on the side of the pool, listening to your instructor, breathing the way he instructs you, moving your hands and legs the way he instructs you, you will never learn how to swim. You have to, in order to learn to swim, you have to get wet. There is no other shortcut to learning to swim. So as in swimming, learning to write comes through trying. Now I will come to the seven fundamental errors. There are thousands of kinds of errors, but there, there are only seven fundamental reasons for these errors. So if you can identify the errors and classify them under one of these categories, you are on your way to becoming a good writer. Number one, poor writing results when you don't know your subject well. If you are not very sure about what you are talking, then we will try to fill up and the readers will forgive you for an occasional lapse in grammar or spelling, but they will not forgive the writer who wastes their time, who, who does not provide them with authentic information. Agreed? Number two, poor writing results when you don't know who the readers are and what they want. You have to know the target or the audience you are targeting. So if you can answer the, the questions that I am giving you, then you, what will the readers do with the information I give them and what decisions do they have to make? How much do the readers already know about the subject? What do they want to know? What do I want them to know? These are the questions you have to ask yourself before you start putting the first word on the paper. To whom? For whom am I writing? What is their level already? How much do they know already? What do I want them to know? Then third point, poor writing results when you don't know how to use the tools of written expression. They have to master the use of tools of written expression, namely grammar, punctuation, spelling, capitalization, and other basics. The readers will not forgive us for sloppy writing. 
poor, the poor writing results when you don't give it the time it requires. Most of the good writers say that I don't write well, but I do rewrite well. So first you put your thoughts on paper, then revise, re-revise. That is the best way of getting at it. Poor writing results when you write to impress your readers instead of to express your ideas. You agree with this? When we try to impress our readers rather than to express our thoughts, then it is likely that we are, we'll end up writing poorly. One paragraph I have given you of a guy trying to write to impress his readers. You go through it and see what, can you grasp the difficulty, you know, it confuses you, all right? Now, poor writing results when you try to hide something from the readers or pretend to know more than you do. So, writers who are uns unsure of their understanding of the subject will fill the introduction or discussion with fluff. You would have seen a few yesterday in the examples given to you. You know, when they are not sure of themselves, they try and... Here is one example of that. Minor head trauma, no? At the, at the end of, you know, you get a, as though one has had a concussion. Difficult. Difficult to see what the guy is arriving at. And seven, poor writing results when you don't, when you don't try hard enough. So the strength of your, your willpower, the strength of your determination will the, make the difference between good and poor writing. You have to have a determination to write well. Now how to choose better words? Simple short words are better than long unfamiliar words. You agree? See what Mark Twain, what he has said, I see no reason to write Metropolis when they pay me the same to write City. Okay, the big writer, they are paid by the word. How did this guy, this name, Mark Twain, how did he get, to get this name? It is his pen name. His name is actually Samuel Langhorne Clements. But he lived near the Mississippi River and this is what the river man used to, you know, shout out to tell the boatman that the water is fathomable. That is, it is two fathoms deep. Mark Twain. Twain means two. Okay. When you choose long, instead of short words, you may be choosing words to impress your readers rather than to express your ideas. An incision was made to visualize the appendix. Why we should put that visualize there? And to see the appendix that conveys as well and much shorter word, much clearer, a word that we use commonly, see. No need to put this kind of. Concrete terms are usually better than abstract terms. Now, concrete terms refer to things we know by one or more of our five senses, namely touch, taste, hearing, smell, and sight. Those are concrete terms. Abstract terms refer to things we know only through our mental process. Anxiety, anguish, all these are abstract. So either the guy has to do something audible or visible so that we can infer that this guy is anxious. Okay? There is no way we can directly visualize this, whereas concrete terms we can visualize. For example, induration, edema, and elevated temperature are all concrete terms we can visualize. However, a patient's anguish is abstract. He can hide it from the 
caregiver or from the doctor. Abstract, again, the most patients improved with therapy. It's an abstract way of saying the same thing. If I put it as 12 of the 50 patients had negative bacteriological cultures after three days of therapy, and another 18 had negative cultures after seven days therapy, which communicates better? The second one. Second one is much more clear. When you put it in abstract terms, it is not as clear as when you put it in concrete terms. Specific terms are usually better than general terms. You can see the examples. Gastrointestinal distress is, you know, kind of fluffy, whereas it is, if you put reflex, it is more pointed. You know what exactly is the thing. Same way, infective illness, if you make it more specific, it will be either cellulitis of some area or gram-negative septicemia, which is more specific. So it is better to go for specific terms, not for general terms. Avoid jargon and redundancies, like females and males. Men and women, good enough, no? Men and women, why? Prepped, instead of that, prepared. 12 midnight, uh, midnight is 12. Why 12 midnight? This is one uh, occupational hazard that, uh, especially this uh, uh, medical uh, fellows have, namely past history. History by definition is past. But every day we keep on instructing, come on, present history, past history, and now there will be future. <laughs> so history by definition is past. Purple in color. Always, many of us write purple in color. Huh? Purple will do. It conveys as well. No need to write the extra words. Literal terms are usually better than figurative terms. It was his last gasp. All you have to say is he made a last attempt. Laboratory animals were sacrificed as though there was singing of hymns and lighting of lamps before they were killed. Laboratory animals were killed. There is no, it is not ritualistic, okay? But in most papers you will find that they were sacrificed. <laughs> it is plain and simple killing only. See, the only only species that can volunteer, only species that can volunteer for an experiment is human. Again, we again, again and again, we make this mistake of adjectivizing that human volunteers, as though rats can volunteer or monkeys can volunteer. No. You have to say volunteer means human. Okay, there is no need to put that adjective. Like that, rats are just taken and killed. You don't get informed consent from them, nothing. Yeah, I just want to talk about this sacrifice and killed. You see, in sacrifice is when you, let's say, there are so many deities in India. You sacrifice that. But when you say you killed, it means you just take it and slaughter it. That's it. That's the difference between sacrifice and killed. No, it's just you humanely, humanely, so that in the laboratory when we heal, we see to it that it is painless, etc., etc., etc. But that doesn't amount to sacrifice. Okay, it is humanely, you know, putting them to death. Okay, it's not sacrifice, whatever you may. I was uh, told, in fact, uh, killed. Uh, is not the word that we should be using. On the other hand, sacrifice is the one that should be preferred by one of the animal ethics committees uh, elsewhere. Uh, that's why 
No, you see the dictionary meaning of sacrifice, it is with hymns and... It says animal is sacrificed because it has a purpose. So this year also the animal has got a purpose, it is for the humanity, the animal is giving his life. What, what wrong if you call the animal is sacrificed? It is for the better, betterment of the humanity. The animal is giving life for the betterment so of the that, human. What we do is we kill them humanely, humanely. We see to it that they don't suffer. So the proper anesthetics are used. Okay. Huh? But that doesn't amount to sacrifice. Okay. Spelling. Again, the be best to have a good dictionary. And medical dictionaries are unreliable sources as far as spelling goes. So, best is to have either Oxford or any of those, Webster or any of those dictionaries. Now, you know, comma, small thing, but lots of problems it can cause. There are instances where a, when a comma can make major difference in meaning. One must use them or omit them according to the meaning one wishes to convey. I'll give you an example. Version 1, he was not chosen to be chief resident because he is the oldest candidate. Now this means he was chosen chief resident but it's not because he is the eldest. It is not because he is the eldest. Now you see the Second version, he was not chosen to be chief's resident, comma, because he is the oldest candidate. He was not chosen chief's res resident and the reason is his age. The comma makes the difference. It is exactly the opposite meaning. So when you put a comma, be careful. You may convey meaning exactly the opposite of what you wish to say. Right? Now coming on to hyphens. Now many spell check programs in word processors and dictionaries are not authorities on hyphenation, just as they are not reliable guides on spelling. But there are a couple of rules that you can go by in order to guide you. And we'll come to that. When two words are used, as one modifier, use a hyphen between them. The best known surgeon. The splotch skin sign. Okay? Agree? Use a hyphen between a prefix and a capitalized word. pre australian practice. Mid-January. Right? Use a hyphen after self when it is used as a prefix. Self-administered. And use a hyphen to prevent misinterpretation or confusion. Man-eating shark is the one that we are scared of and so that we won't get into water. Whereas the other one is a guy sitting in a restaurant and eating minced shark. Puttu. Okay, so it's very important to avoid misinterpretation. Now coming to slash, also called oblique, stroke, and diagonal, bar or diagonal. In most cases, it means that the reader may take his choice of the two things separated by the line. It also carries the implication that the two things are the same or nearly the same. Same. Same or nearly the same. See, videos slash films are useful teaching aids. Okay. Or if a pharmacologist like me who writes that cephalosporin slash aminoglycoside therapy is recommended means that either antibiotic may be used. Okay. The person can have a choice. Either he can use streptomycin or he can use a cephalosporin. It has also got certain specialized usages such as 
a substitute for per as in 10 milligram per ml. It can also be used in dates and also for separating the numerator from the denominator. Very common uses. Now coming on to common capitalization problems. That is especially this is so with the names of microorganisms. Now when you write names of microorganisms, capitalize the genus but not the species of the organism when both are given. Like Staphylococcus aureus, you have to capitalize the S but not the aureus. Genus has to be capitalized but not the species. However, when the plural of the organism is used, then you can staphylococci were susceptible, pseudomonal infection. There is no need to capitalize. Although you write the genus, there is no need to capitalize if it is the plural of the organism that you are writing. Common tendency is to capitalize all drug names. Yeah, there is absolutely no need for capitalizing drug names. I think probably because they are paying so much for it. Now, title of a book, journal, pamphlet, or government bulletin, capitalize the first and the last words and all other words that are not articles, short prepositions, or conjunctions. Also used italics for all this. So thus, the title of a book will look like this. See all the prepositions, conjunctions, etc. are not capitalized. You have to capitalize the first and the last words and all other words which are not articles, short prepositions or conjunctions. That's why and, the and all are not capitalized. The others you have to capitalize. This is very important to follow. When you, when you are putting your uh, reference list and all that, it's important. Now coming to numbers. Single digit number should be spelled out. Numbers of two or more digits should be expressed as numerals. Six patients and 26 patients, okay? The major exception when writing about standard units of measure use numerals, nine cc and 14 miles, okay? When you are using standard units of measure, then you, are, you can use the numerics. This except, uh, exception has an amendment. If you must begin the sentence with a number, write the number and the unit of measurement in words, like 19 cubic centimeters of water was added, 12,000 feet of cable connected the labs. So when you have to begin a sentence, with a numeral, write the whole thing. When you are using the standard units of measurement in between, okay? Whereas when you have to start a sentence with a numeral, then spell it out completely. When you must begin a sentence with a year, however, use numerals. I have given the example, 1999 is not the last year of the millennium, 2000 is. Again, while writing percentage, use Arabic numeral and the sign percent. Only 5% responded. If two numerical expressions must be written consecutively, spell out the one that is more easily expressed as a word. Like in men over 30, 30 is a much smaller, I mean just six letters. 16 infections, 16 is a longer one. So spell out the word, the one that is easily expressed. So if it was five and 30, I'll write five, and then 30 I will put it in numerals. Write decimals in figures. Put a zero in front of the decimal unless the decimal itself begins with a zero. I've given you example. 
the plant grows 0 0.79 of a foot in one year. The second one says the plant grew only 0 0.07 of the foot this year because of the drought. So, if it is starting with the 0, then there is no reason to put a 0. Otherwise, you have to put 0 0.79 to avoid confusion, because sometimes that point may be missed. Now, to conclude, good writing is difficult to define. It is easier to say what it is not than to say what it is. And as Matthew Arnold, the famous English writer and critic said, the essence of style is to have something to say and to say it as clearly as one can. Now, if you have any questions, I am prepared to answer. Uh, Sometimes the organism is the right in capital letters. Which one? Organism names. I miss binomial nomenclature, like some uh, organism, microorganism. They put in capital letters. In that case, uh, uh, it is correct or not? No, it is on the only the capital should be the genus, the species. The it should I mean, start the with letters, the capital. All the letters. No, I have no, seen in no, some that's not, not necessary. Not necessary. Like I said, Staphylococcus aureus means S should be capitalized. Right. <coughs> Nothing. And if it is coming in the title of a book, the whole thing. Sometimes I have seen they they italicize the names. They italicize the uh, this uh, organism names. Right. Sometimes. <laughs> no more questions. When there are not many questions, I either feel that it is all gone above your head. Huh? This kind of silence, I, I find it too noisy. <laughs> One question, sir. You said yeah. in the beginning uh, what the reader knows and what must you, you must say to supplement. This is okay with the uh, literary writing, what the reader knows, what you have to give them. That's creative writing, what that's that. Thing. But in scientific writing, I don't know what the reader knows. What I have done the work, I am presenting it before the readers. You have to observe these rules of grammar, spelling, that's okay. and all that. All that's all. all. That's all. This to the modern uh, socio-economical journalism, it's okay. But li literary no, no, writing. No, no, no. But let me tell you, a good idea, badly written, may be rejected. But a bad idea, well written, may be accepted. Okay. So it is very important to, to uh, you know, take into account the style, the language, etc when you write. This whole presentation as well as the, the resources right. are right. in the website, ICMR's website. One thing I wanted to clarify, sir, uh, where you mentioned that the prepositions are not to be started with capitals in a title. Title. But then uh, there was a word throughout. You started that with a capital. Is that okay? Throughout? <coughs> throughout is not a noun, but still it was starting with capital. In the it's, title, it is it is not a proposition. It is not a conjunction, nor is it an article. No. So it's okay. Another common mistake which is made, and as an editor, it's very annoying, is the use of the indefinite and the definite uh, article, a and and the. It is always put where it's not required, and it is not put where it is required, and you spend your whole time putting it. When you refer to one person, usually you have to add the, the patient was asked to do this. But when you are writing a group of patients, there is no need for an article. Patients were asked to report after 48 days. But many people make this mistake, they don't use this uh, definite and indefinite article properly and you have to spend a lot of time putting it in uh, where it is required and taking it out where it is not required. Like uh, you know, we all come, we come from the Jipmar they say. It is not proper, is it not? As if it is the only place in God made on earth. It is, we come from Jipmar. But uh, many people, these are the people from the Jipmar. They introduce us and then we sort of feel a little uncomfortable. I had a colleague who used to introduce himself as, I am the Kerala. <laughs> Joke. <laughs> okay, then if there are no further questions, before the timekeeper takes out her AK-47, I will... 
Thank you, sir, for the compliment.